what I'm speaking to you on this morning is exploring the wisdom of God. Amen. Exploring the wisdom of God. And there are three main things that I want us to look at. Our premise for this morning, number one, that the state of our lives reflects the wisdom that we have. The state of your life now reflects the wisdom that you have. Secondly, we underestimate or fail to be aware of the wisdom of God available to us. Many times as believers, we underestimate or fail to be aware of the wisdom of God that is available to us to assess. And thirdly, if we have time, we'll deal with this one as well. Problems of our time are meant for us to overcome by divine wisdom. That the problems of our time, they are not just meant to frustrate us, but in actual fact, they are meant for us to overcome and in doing so, demonstrate God's own wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7. Let's start from there. Get wisdom and in all you're getting, get understanding. Um, the new King James says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If there's anything of importance that you can commit to, is to get wisdom. And as you do that, develop also the ability to make wise judgment, make wise decisions. Another translation, let's use the Holman Christian Standard Bible, says wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And whatever else you get, get understanding. Wisdom is supreme. Wisdom is primary, is to be our main focus. If there's anything that you should pursue, pursue wisdom, go after wisdom, and get understanding that you live life with understanding. You're not just going through life, but you, if we check the content of your life, we see that you demonstrate a certain level of understanding of the basics of the human life. Amen. Because wisdom is primary. We, this morning we're going to look at a lot of verses in Proverbs. Salah. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 16, verse 16. Proverbs 16, verse 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. Wisdom throughout the scripture is when put against pre uh, precious gold, silver, any precious and valuable item that you can think of, the admonition is always to go for wisdom. Because wisdom can get you that which you don't have. You can have other things. Have you ever seen any... Um, People who are wealthy, but they, don't, they are no wise. You can, you can, you can be, <laughs> you can have material possessions, but lack wisdom. Demonstrate a lack of understanding and discernment. Amen. So this is what we are to choose. Proverbs chapter three. Let's look from the verse thirteen to fifteen. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. And the man who gains understanding. Wisdom is able to change the disposition of a man's life. It's able to brighten his countenance. It's able to give you joy and hope. Because wisdom itself is a personality and we'll get to that. And when you begin to gain understanding, understanding of your life, of your purpose, of what God has called you to, you begin to demonstrate or begin to walk in joy, walk in happiness. Next verse. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. 15. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that you may desire cannot compare with her. The reason why wisdom is supreme, is principle, is because no matter what you desire, what is your heart's desire now, think about the things that you so desire this morning as you sit here and you are wondering, okay, if I only I could get access to this, if only I could get, you know, my hands on, on these things. And ask yourself, is wisdom one of them? Is understanding one of them? 
But you can't compare. They are incomparable. If you can't compare the wisdom of God to rubies, to pearls, things that are passing, they are fleeting, that can perish. The wisdom of God is able to sustain a man and to preserve him and to cause him to rise up above his contemporaries, even above nations. Amen. So let's define wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is practical skills associated with understanding and living a successful life. This morning, and I feel like teaching. Amen. Practical skills. The practical skills associated with with understanding and living a successful life. You can also say that it's the divine intellectual ability to live life skillfully. A divine intellectual ability to live life skillfully. Basically, God's own power, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, 2. I don't go there. Let's stay here. God's own ability to give us that divine intellectual capacity to live life skillfully. There's a skill to life. Many of us are just going every day, but the life that you are living has been lived and lived and lived and lived. Everybody has their own path. But there is a skill to live in life. And God's desire is that we will crack the code of how to live life skillfully. The more challenging the times are, the more difficult the times are, the more it is required that the children of God demonstrate understanding and wisdom and not waste energy, not waste skill. So we ought to walk with our lives, our minds, our hearts sharpened. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, says that when the axe head is sharp, less effort is needed. So what happens is if your, your, the, your life is blunt, if you don't have your sharpness and, 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 and you know, much understanding, it will require more skill, more effort to use you as an axe. In the same way, even in your own life, you will always need more effort because you are not sharp. You are not cutting. You know, you know what we call cutting edge, cutting edge technology. It's up to date. It's, um, it's like penetrating. You know, it's, it's, it's the kind of technology that, you know, when it's accessible to a generation, it is able to transform the times and to bring advantage to men. God wants us to walk in that level of understanding so that your life is sharp, you not waste energy, you not waste effort, you not waste time. So we ought to give premium to wisdom. You can also write this, that it is also the divine capacity to make decisions that result in favorable outcomes. The divine capacity to make decisions that result in favorable outcomes and avoid unnecessary troubles and complications to life. Let me say that again. Wisdom is the divine capacity to make decisions that result in favorable outcomes and avoid unnecessary troubles and complications to life. There are challenges that every human being will go through. Just because you're on the face of this earth, there are things that you definitely have to go through. There are challenges that God allows our way as a form of testing so that we can graduate to the next stage of life. We can graduate to the next class. But many of the challenges and the complications that beset us are unnecessary. You end up just having wasted years, wasted time, and regret. So our aim living on this side of eternity is that we, we don't even have that much time. We don't have that much time to be wasting on unnecessary things. There is a skill to life. There's a way God can give a man wisdom that he makes decisions that 
causes him to avoid unnecessary complications, unwanted troubles. How many of us would have a life like that? The thing is, it is available to you and I. But the challenge is we don't pay attention. We don't give heed to wisdom. Wisdom is calling out to us, but not many respond. Not many go in to dine with wisdom. Not many pursue wisdom. Not many have a heart to interact and to walk in that divine wisdom of God. Jesus demonstrated in his life that there is a way a man can live without error. For the 30-something years of Jesus' life, he did not make a mistake. How can a man walk, live on this earth, in this sinful world, living under oppression? You think we are living in difficult times? It's not the first of generations. In their time, things were difficult. They were imagine living in, in Ghana and you are being ruled by another nation. We complain about taxes today. Now imagine paying taxes, but the taxes that you are paying, they are not even used for your own development. They are taken to develop another country, another nation. Those were the times that he was living in. Things were not all, all good. Things were not all easy and simple. Difficult times, but he was able to live a life. And in demonstrating that, what he was saying to us is, friends, this is the wisdom that is available to you. This is the wisdom by which you are to operate. There's a wisdom that causes a man to walk in alignment with the mind of God. So that like Adam, in that place where God has made him and he breathed the breath of life into him. That breath of life, if it's proceeding from God, contains the wisdom of God. Are you following? Because whatever proceeds from God is packed with wisdom. So as God breathed into Adam, he was breathing wisdom, discernment, understanding, insight, foresight, intelligence, and a, a, a certain capacity with which he was to dominate and take over the earth. Without wisdom, you can't take over territories. There's no way that God would have given Adam the mandate and the woman the mandate to take over the earth, to advance his kingdom without wisdom. You can't do that without wisdom. So in the breath of God that he gave him, that wisdom was deposited into him. He says, I have made you in my image, in my likeness. When you look at God, you see a demonstration of the wisdom of God. He, his whole operation is wisdom. When you look at his creation, you see wisdom displayed. In fact, one of the best apologetics is that in creation, you can tell that there is a God. And that God is intelligent because the creation is, um, gives us that revelation, you might say, of intelligent design. Now, if there's an intelligent design, if the creation has been in, in, designed intelligently, it sounds to reason that there is somebody behind it who also is intelligent. So all of God's cre creation is filled with, packed with revelation of not just his glory, but his wisdom. And God is saying, the same way that he birthed Adam, he has given birth to us. He has put his spirit and his, the life of God is at work in you. So it is not far-fetched for me to say this morning that the wisdom of God is available to you. That same wisdom that with which he created the world and created the eons, the ages, is packed inside of you. The challenge is we don't pay attention. We are not pursuing after this. Biblical wisdom is always associated with trust in and the fear of God. Biblical wisdom. Is to trust in God and to fear him. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Let's do chapter 4 verse 6 very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 6. You have it? Okay. Okay. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. The Lord was giving them his commands, his statutes, and he was saying to them, observe them. 
Be careful, be mindful to observe them because that is a display of wisdom and understanding. That's how everybody will begin. All those around you will see that you are walking in wisdom is that you, you demonstrate in your life that you walk not by the dictates and the counsel of men, but by the counsel of God. So if we are to walk and display that level of wisdom, friends, it comes primarily by seeking God. It comes fundamentally by pursuing him and walking, living according to his word. There is the wisdom of the world, which is there, but the Bible calls it the elementary wisdom. It's basic wisdom. The wisdom of that is ingrained in science and all that is elementary. It's on a lower level. There's a higher dimension of the wisdom of God, and which is what you and I are called to. And the Lord is saying that the way you walk in this is that what I say, you live by it. That man is not just living by what you eat. What you, uh, you don't just live by your affections and your flesh, what you are feeling, but you are living on what I am saying. And that's how you, you walk in the counsel of God. Hallelujah. So let's deal with the first thing that I said. That the state of our lives reflects the wisdom that we have. This is not an indictment on anybody. Like I said, it's something that is personal. I'm meditating on it and, and looking at it personally. And it is challenging. It is sometimes it can be discouraging. That as you see me, whichever state of life that I'm at is a display of the wisdom that I have and that I have assessed and processed to this point in my life. And it's the same for each and every one of us. Any adult, take out the children, but any young person who has transitioned as an adult that is walking, making decisions, living, here's the point. Your life, as you see it, is a summary of the wisdom that you have and that you are able to display. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3. Let me back up this point with scripture. 24 verse 3. It says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. Through wisdom. Wisdom is a medium or a, a device for construction. The, your house, the house there is not just a physical building, but the house there is, the, you might say, the house of your life. When we look at your life, we will see wisdom being displayed. Just like I said, when you look at creation, you see the wisdom of God in creation. In the same way, when we look at your life, we see the level of wisdom. It's challenging, right? That even as you look at us as a church, as you look at the church, how far the, the, the Lord has brought the church, and where we are, it's, it's a current display of the wisdom that is accessible to us. This morning, I want to challenge you. I'm in your home. When we come to your home, have you ever, you, you, there are people you visit and you, you look at their home and it's not, let, let me tell you, it's not any, any expensive stuff. But there's a display of the wisdom of God. You see the way things are arranged. You see the way things are in order. You see how uh, uh, things that are of little value have been made to look beautiful and you can see the wisdom of God in display. God is not a wasteful God. The ministry, as you see, it is a display of wisdom. This is why I'm challenged by this. And I want to challenge you as well. That if we are to go on, we have to press beyond the wisdom, current wisdom that we have. And there's more that is available to us. When you look at Ghana right now, it is a display of the wisdom, the cumulative wisdom of all the leaders to this point. The current state of our economy is a display of wisdom. It's a, it's a level of wisdom. <laughs> you want me to go on? You want to get me in trouble? <laughs> it's a display of wisdom. 
both for the current administration and the immediate past the, uh, um, administration. So when you see all the complications and all the frustrations, there's a, there's a hunger. Like I said, it's not an indictment, even on them. It's that we must cry out to God and say, God, we've been going around in circles. We go to IMF, and then we come back, and then we go again. So it's a level of wisdom. It's a level of wisdom that we don't have. And until we go on our knees and begin to cry out to God, it is, it's not possible. Or until those who have attained a certain level of wisdom, the kind of wisdom that is able to lift up a generation, are in the right place, we remain grounded. So if you don't walk in wisdom, you remain grounded. By understanding it is established. Your life is established by wisdom and on wisdom. Next verse. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So when, again, when we look at your life, what is your life filled with? That word filled also could mean fulfillment. If you are living a fulfilled life, it means that wisdom is at play. If you look at your life and it's not filled with precious things, valuable things. It means that there's something that is lacking. There's something that is missing. Amen. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1 says that a wise woman builds her house. There's a, there's a way a woman, God gives a woman wisdom to be able to build a home, a house that becomes a place of habitation, of peace, of calm, of nourishment. But fools pull it down or pulls it down with her hands. In the same way that you can have wisdom to build your life, folly, foolishness will cause you to bring down anything that is built by wisdom. And that's why we ought to be praying. That's why the scripture says we should pray for our leaders. Because if you, you can build... And if a foolish person comes in, they can destroy everything that has been built. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1. The wisdom has built her house. Do you see that? So wisdom is, to, is, to, is into construction. Wisdom builds. When you have wisdom, there's, watch, there's a display of that wisdom. It must be displayed. It must be made manifest. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has curated, constructed out her seven pillars. Seven in the Bible means perfection, completeness. When you build on wisdom, your life is complete and your life displays perfection. See why scripture says that we ought to have wisdom. We should pursue wisdom. If you are building according to the divine wisdom of God, you will be established. You will stand firm. Your standing will be perfect. Even in times of challenges, difficulties, when nations are going down, you know, we are the ones who are complaining that things are bad. Do you know that even during, at the height of COVID, there were those who were making money? Currently, the way we are, you are singing, it seems like everybody is singing the chorus, oh, times are difficult. Not everybody. So there is a wisdom that is not available to majority of the people. There is a wisdom that is not accessible. And the challenge is that even the children of God, for a lack of knowledge, are perishing. So when will we wake up to this reality and say that I am not called to live at this dimension and stop blaming others. Stop blaming the system. I need to be careful not to go ahead of myself. Because even the difficulties, the challenges of our time, you can display wisdom, a skill, so that it be, the, the challenges become an advantage to you. You have to assess your life and accept the fact that what you have displayed so far is the level of wisdom that you have. There are people who have advantage because there is a level of wisdom that their parents operated by. So you see that even from a young age, they are already displaying a certain level of understanding 
that many don't have. But guess what? God is saying, I am your father. Even if you do not, it does not matter what your background is. Even if you didn't have a mother and a father, God is saying, as long as my spirit is in you, as, as long as I'm the one who's called you, you can connect with me in a way that my transmission to you, my download to you, is that dimension of that wisdom that is able to confound the best of men. This is one of the privileges of being a child of God. It is dishonorable to God when we display a lack of wisdom. God wants his children to walk in wisdom. Can you change this to the message translation? Please. Lady Wisdom has built and finished her home. It is supported by seven hewn timbers. Lady Wisdom. The wisdom is personified as a woman. It looks like the woman has have advantage. Hallelujah. So we are to seek wisdom because it will define our lives. And we also ought to understand that what has brought you thus far is incapable of taking you to the next level. Whatever has brought you to this level from January, the reason why we are dealing with this is that so that we will not keep going around in circles. Look at your life from January to now. What has fundamentally been different from last year? Has there been any tangible difference in the way you are living in your life from 2021, 2020? If not, then we ought to come to that place where we acknowledge that we need something else to take us to the next level. When you are traveling, those of you who travel, I've, I've traveled outside of the country, the same vehicle, the same mode of transportation that takes you to the airport is not the same mode of transportation you use to go to another continent. So it depends, your pursuit on, on wisdom depends on you. Depends on how far you go, you're going, how far you want to go how far you want to reach. That would de determine how much time and how much of your resources and commitment you, you spend in pursuing the wisdom of God. If you know you are going to England or you're going to the Americas, you know that what has brought you to the airport is not the same. You can't sit and take that taxi to... So if you want to begin to see in your life transformation, it comes by acknowledging... God, I believe your promises, they are true. You are not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent. But I see my limitation. I see that there is a way that I have been doing this business. And when I measure it according to your promises, it seems like something that is not aligning. I have been praying and praying, oh my word, if only prayer warriors will spend time praying for wisdom. Perhaps give more glory to God. I only say that to say that the, the sad thing about it, the challenging thing about that is many times um, when you look at the church, people praying and, and you know, groaning and, and all that energy and all that transmission, power being generated. And many times when you check, we check the life, we scan the life, there's no display of the wisdom of God. So we come to that place where we say, God, there is a, I've been praying, I've been crying out, I've been confessing your word, your promises, but there's something that I'm lacking. There is a skill to life. The life that God has called you to, there is a skill to it. And until you recognize, or you and I recognize our limitation, there's no way we can go further. We remain in the same place. We remain grounded. Amen. So like I said before, the starting point of wisdom is to bring to cry out to God. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the commencement of wisdom is that you begin to have reverent awe for God. You, the, the way that display of wisdom is, that's why scripture says that only a fool says in his heart there is no God. Because he looks around, he sees all the wonderful things, and yet he says there is no God. So that's foolishness. But the fear of God is that you begin to, not that you are afraid of God. No, that's not what it means. It means that there's reverence for God. There's honor for God. There's understanding of the place of God. Like God, there's no one like you. That you are awesome, you are magnificent, you are the Lord of Lords, you are King of Kings. And you begin to pursue that great reward and that great price above all else. Which is why any person, any child of God must pursue the kingdom of God like he has found a treasure. And it's worth selling everything to come and invest in this treasure. It is worth, listen, it is worth spending time in the word of God. It's worth it. You pursuing God, how much of your resource, your most valuable, perhaps your time, how much of your resource are you spending in pursuing God? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But to do contrary is foolishness. To go and chase what is not worth it, what will not bring life, what will not transform your life, is foolishness. To despise instruction, to despise counsel. Don't live your life in a way that people can't advise you. Sometimes you can even learn from your critics. In fact, many times. It's the way it might be packaged that would be offensive. But when, we, when you check carefully, there's a 2%. That is true. Take that 2%. Take that 2%. And in that place of acknowledging God, you begin to receive instruction. You begin to receive direction. If you don't acknowledge God, God will not give you instruction. In Matthew chapter 13, the verse 11, it says that it has been given to you to know, to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The secrets of it has been given to you. Pay attention to this carefully. You and I have that privilege. It's been given to us. God says concerning the council of heaven, it's been given to you that you can understand the technology and the systems by which my kingdom operates. Everything has been made available to you. To you it has been given. Verse 12. Now here's the complication. For whoso, whoever has, to him more will be given. So who, if you have more of the understanding of the mysteries of God, more will be given to you. You will have abundance. But who have, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So you start off with some deposit of wisdom. If you don't pursue for more, even what you have will be taken from you. God will not invest. He does not throw um, treasure, pearls before swine. God will not give to somebody who is not pursuing him. It, in fact, it will be an indictment on you. If God should give you wisdom, more wisdom, more understanding, more insight, and you are not pursuing, you are not pursuing, coming after his heart, he's indicting you. So many times, even when he will, t- he will speak in parables, because if he speaks, so long as he speaks it, and they don't obey what he's speaking, they are indicted. They are, they, that will be their judgment. Are you following me? But to you and I, we have the privilege. I want you to say, it's been given to me. To understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's your privilege. It's your heritage. God is not hiding anything from, from you. The secret things belong to him. But the things that he has revealed belongs to the children of God. And to our generations forever. Jeremy 29, 29. But, so let's go on. So as you acknowledge God, he begins to give you instruction and direction. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser still. Do you see that? When God will give instruction to a wise man, the reason you have to pursue wisdom, if you are not pursuing wisdom understanding, God cannot give you. However, if you begin to walk and to operate in that wisdom of God, he says, if I give you instruction, you will be wiser. Teach a just man 
and he will increase in learning. If you teach one who is righteous, who is pursuing justice, to live righteously, he will increase in learning. But if you give to a man who is walking in wickedness, who is walking in sin, can you imagine? Even with the level of wisdom that they have, look at the wickedness that is in the world. Can you imagine if God begins to give people divine wisdom? I will run away. So God cannot give wisdom to those who are not pursuing him. But the flip side is also true. That if you are coming after him, he will give you instruction. Isaiah 30 verse 18. Isaiah 30 verse 18. Now when you concentrate on your teacher. So there's the preceding verse. But let's stay here. When you focus on him. You are pursuing. Your eyes are on your teacher. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. If your eyes are on God. He will begin to speak to you. He will begin to instruct you. He says, therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And the Lord will be also. No, that's not the scripture I'm looking for. 30, is it 32? You will hear a voice behind you saying, here is the way, walk in it. You will begin to hear. Oh, 21, okay. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. So as you are going, you are living your life, your eyes are on your teacher. Your eyes are on him. The Holy Spirit is leading you. Because when the Spirit of God is leading, he will lead you in wisdom. In, in, you know, he will cause you to make the right decisions. When you make a turn, you say, okay, now, turn left, turn right. He will begin to give you instruction. So many times, if you realize that you are not receiving instruction and direction from God, you need to check your location. You need to check if your eyes are on him. You need to check if you are listening to him. You need to just scan your life and see, am I pursuing the wisdom of God? Or am I pursuing my own interest? Because God cannot give you instruction if your mind is not set on him. If you're not coming after him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you begin to pursue knowledge of God, understanding of God, knowing him, having intimacy with him, he will instruct you. He will give you direction. So you want direction for precise, accurate direction for life, for relationship, for marriage, for business, for whatever God has called you to. Come after him. It's the beginning point of wisdom. Is that you begin to pursue God. Then he will cause the others to unfold for you. Hallelujah. Many times we, we, we look at a man by name Solomon. And we understand that Solomon was a man who pursued wisdom. Or he, who, was, who asked God for wisdom. But I want to show you a couple of things that I had noticed about Solomon. First Chronicles chapter 22 verse 19. His father himself was his father himself was David, who also was known as a man of wisdom. In fact, David's wisdom was such that he 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 um, amassed everything that his child needed to build the temple. You, you can you make a vow to yourself? That you not let your children go through some of the things that you went through. That you live your life in such a way that it gives them an advantage. This is what David said to Solomon. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. You see that? The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of God. That you are pursuing God. And pursue Set your heart and your soul to seek God. Therefore, arise and build a sanctuary. Without seeking God, you can't build. There's no way that Solomon can build. When the temple, that, that temple was said to be in that age. It was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. People would just come to come and look at construction. Stone. And it's like, wow. Your God is great. Therefore, arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord to build. To bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy articles of God into the house that the Lord, that is to be built for the name of the Lord. So, so wisdom also makes you understand, causes you to understand that the presence of God is needed in a nation, in your oppression. But that's not where I'm going to. First Kings 
chapter 3. Because many times we focus on, I'm just buttressing the point that when you pursue wisdom and you begin to walk in wisdom, God will give you more. Because we just focus on the part that Solomon asked God for wisdom. And we actually think that that was the beginning of his wisdom. But scripture says contrary. In 1st chapter 3 verse 3, um, when you read from the beginning um, of, the, of the chapter 2, his father, David, had some enemies left. And so he mandated him to, you know, just finish them off so that he, his kingdom will be stable. He can walk in peace. He can reign in peace, okay? So he gave him that wisdom. In the chapter 3, verse 3, it says this, And Solomon loved the Lord. Do you see that? Solomon loved the Lord. You don't love God, you can't walk in wisdom. Walking in the statues of his father, David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Next verse. We're going all the way to the 9. Now the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. For that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. So his affection to God, with, to God his, 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 his love for God caused him to sacrifice. He wanted to give all, he wanted to give God the best. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. You don't love God, God can't appear to you. You're not pursuing him, he can't appear to you. And God, God asked him, what shall I give you? What shall I give you? It's because he loved the Lord, the Lord came to him and asked him, what shall I give you? Next verse. And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him and you have given him a son to sit on the throne. Next, as it is this day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. That's when you, when you begin to acknowledge your limitation, God will help you. If you, you say you are all wise and almighty, God can't help you. Solomon acknowledged that. Said, God, look at these guys. Though. I can't. Like, I'm just a, a, a child. I'm just a young man. Help me. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made your servant king. Where are we? And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people too numerous to be numbered or counted. The, the, more, the bigger your vision and what God has called you to, the more wisdom you need. Next verse. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people. That I may descend between good and evil. For who is able to judge this people of yours? Give to your servant an understanding heart. A heart to discern. This is my desire. This is what I want. Many of us think that when God comes to you, you ask for wisdom. Now, time will not allow us. But when you go back, read this, the whole chapter. You discover that. Solomon was actually dreaming. It was not that God came to him physically. This was in a vision of the night. It was in a dream. That means that in his subconscious, in his heart of heart, this was what he was asking for. This is what he was, he was going after. Many of us, God can't come to you now. <laughs> it's too risky for God to ask you that question. In a dream, that what do you want? Because when he asks you, he will be mandated to fulfill that. Because you are not pursuing that wisdom. Are you getting me? So you, you might say that, oh, when we say, okay, let's pray for wisdom. Say, God, give me wisdom. God, no, 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 no. It must be the primary desire of your heart. So that even when you are sleeping and God wakes you up, he says, what do you want? Say, wisdom. What do you want? Understanding. What do you want? God, help me. This vision, this thing you've called me to, I need your help. So oh, as if God should appear right now. What do you want? House. <laughs> God, marriage. Confirmation. Car. One million dollars. It's too risky for God. In your heart of heart, desire wisdom. 
I actually want to start in, in the chapter 2. So let's do 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. It's 13 to 25. Oh, wow. I don't know if we'll have time to deal with this. Let's do the verse 6 first. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 6. We'll go as far as we can. Right. Therefore, do according to your wisdom. So this is his father. You remember I was saying to you that he was advising him to finish his enemy so that he could live a, peace, a peaceable life. This is what David said to him. Therefore, do according to what? Your wisdom. So there was a wisdom that David saw in Solomon. There was a wisdom that he saw in the young man. Okay. And do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. Now, that was concerning Joab, his commander who had killed Abner and the other guy. He had killed them in a time of peace and he shouldn't have done that. So that's why he was, he was but you can read the context so you understand more. Now jump to verse 9. Verse 9, very quickly. Now therefore, do not hold him guiltless for you are a wise man and you know what you ought to do. Do you see that? So, Solomon, this is chapter 2. Before the chapter 3 we read. <laughs> Are you here? So in chapter 2, David was saying concerning his son, Solomon, you are a wise man. Give a wise man instruction and he will be wiser still. The reason why God gave Solomon that dimension of wisdom, because the guy was already demonstrating, one, a pursuit for God, like his father told him, Go after God. Secondly, he, in him was a dep- that desire to walk and operate with wisdom. Where your treasure is, there your heart will lie. What you, what, what you want is that's where your heart will be. His heart, the guy's heart from a young age was for wisdom. To the extent that his daddy saw that in him. And God saw that in him. In him. And so God came to him and said, if I give you wisdom, you operate and you live by it. And this is what we are called to. To not just have the wisdom of God, but also to grow in it, to increase in it like Jesus did. Let's do point two. I, I will deal with point three later to, uh, next week. Secondly, so the second thing we, we, we the premise we started with was this. We underestimate or fail to be aware of the wisdom of God available to us. Ha. Huh. I will need grace to do this very quickly. We underestimate the wisdom of God that is available to you and I. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. Let's do 22 to 25. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews were looking for a Messiah, a conquering king who will come and vanquish their enemies and he will display wis- uh, wisdom, he will display power, he will display might, miraculous working power of God. This is what the Jews were looking out for. Right? In spite of all the signs that Jesus was displaying. So sometimes you're, you're <laughs> you might be doing things, but <laughs> it's like all that he was doing, they still want, you ask yourself, what more sign do you want? It shows the, the direction of their heart. All right? The Greeks seek after wisdom. For the Greeks, they were pursuing a certain display of intellect. That elementary wisdom. Okay? The Jews had a challenge with the gospel of Jesus Christ being proclaimed. Because they are like, ah, what savior dies as a criminal? A savior can, can die. A savior, and he died as a criminal, you must be joking. The Greeks were saying, what manner of philosophy is this? It sounds enticing, but the problem is, you are talking about resurrection. That a man died and he resurrected. It's rubbish. Moreover, he died as a criminal. He died. Now, have you seen a blue man die before? <laughs> That's what we call the protagonist in the, in, the, in the movie. Have you ever seen the, the, the main guy? Like, imagine eh? Tom Cruise dying at the end of the movie. The Greeks were like, forget this nonsense. Take your Jesus away. Okay, next verse. 23, very quickly. 
So that's just to say that even today, people have the same thinking, the same mindset. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. What we preach, Jesus crucified, is above the wisdom of men. That you can't please God, you can't come to God in your own doing. God has simplified it in a way that everybody that will come must just believe in him. The only requirement is faith. It's not the number of things that you do. This is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us, those who are being saved, it's the wisdom of God. Verse 24. But to those who are called, those who are his, those who are appointed, those who are initiated, both amongst the Jews and the Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is both the power of God. Many times we know the Holy Spirit as power. But you see, the, the, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God is Father, God, God is Spirit, God is Son. The Son is Father, the Son is Spirit. The Spirit is Father, the Spirit is Son. So when you see Jesus, you see a manifestation of the power of God at work. He's a, he's a fullness of, of, that's why he couldn't help it. Wherever he was going, he was demonstrating power. And he's also the wisdom of God. In all of his operations, you see wisdom at work. He didn't waste time. He didn't waste life. He didn't waste energy. Wisdom all throughout. He's the personification of the wisdom of God. Colossians chapter 2 says that in him are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In him, in Christ, are the treasures. In him, like, there's, there's a vault of wisdom in him. And this is the Christ that has been given to us. This is the Christ who belongs to us. Amen. That's Colossians 2, 3. The power of God and the wisdom of God. He's not just wisdom. He's also power. In the, in the power of God you display, in, when you see the power of God at work, you see wisdom at work. When you see the wisdom of God at work, you see power displayed. The wisdom of God is power over every other power. When you begin to display that dimension of God's wisdom, it subdues the enemy. I wish I had time to deal with this. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. Christ, our wisdom. This is what we fail to comprehend and understand. That the Jesus who you have believed in, he is your wisdom. <sighs> Jesus is my wisdom. He has become wisdom for me. Amen. He has become wisdom for our sakes. That's, so before we do this, let's do it. First Corinthians chapter 2, the, the verse 30. So go back and then go to the verse 30. It says, the verse 30, 3 zero. 1 verse 30, sorry. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. That was the wisdom of God made manifest. He became for us. He came, the wisdom of God came in a packet that you could access. So it's not far away from me. He became wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. I want you to say, say that Jesus Christ became for me wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification. So the Lord that you have, the one you call Lord, Master, he is your wisdom. You have no excuse to live a subpar life, to live beyond your potential. Because the wisdom of God is at work in you, is present in you. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8. Let's do it out quickly. From verse 8 to 10. To me, who, I, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given to me. Paul says that I was unqualified. I was not, I, I, it should not have happened. I was the least of the least. But grace was given to me. The grace that, same grace that says when it's given to a man, it causes him to do something, to produce something. And what it caused Paul to do was to begin to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. This riches you can't drop. Time on our school, but when you go back, read Job 28. There's a dimension of the wisdom of God that is not available in textbooks. You can't find it in men. Believers, Christians, you need, to, uh, you need to get this. You can spend time studying. It's good. We need to. But look at the time, the resources. Let's see how expensive education is. So expensive university education. If you want to take, do your master's, doctorate, whatever it is. See the resources we commit to it, to elementary principles of the world. How much do you spend 
Invest in exploring the unsearchable riches of Christ. Next verse. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The stewardship of the mystery. The mystery of God that was given to him. He was having fellowship with him. He was displaying. He was stewarding that mystery. Remember to us has been given the mysteries of the kingdom. So Paul stewarded his well. Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. Who created all things through Jesus Christ. God is the source. And he's also the reason for which we have Jesus. In Jesus Christ has been hidden or has been created all things or through, through him all things were created. Through Jesus Christ everything was created. Next verse. Verse 10. To the intent to the, the purpose that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to might be made known by who? By the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Change it to the amplified version. The, the reason that Paul was displaying the mysteries of God. The, 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 it, was, he, uh, it was entrusted to him. That amount of revelation was that the church would then take that and begin to display the manifold wisdom of God. The amplifier says the infinite variety and measurable aspects. But this might be made known to the angelic rulers and authorities, principalities in the heavenly sphere. This is what you and I are called to. This wisdom has not even been made known to you. You have not even started displaying it to yourself. Yet to talk about principalities and rulers. Hence my point. That we don't even realize we don't consider, we are not understanding the level of the divine wisdom of God available to us in the gospel as people who have been entrusted with the oracles of God. Today, like the Jews were, we have a mystery and wisdom available to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, it says that, do you not know that you will judge angels? You know why you can't judge angels. You are not pursuing God. Angels who are looking, they are beholding God's glory day and night. For eons. You, you need the wisdom of God. But here, what I'm driving at is this. Friend, this is what we are called to. And it is not far-fetched. There are men who walk by this. Men like Joseph. Next week we'll deal with that. Who walk by the divine wisdom of God. That even in times of challenges... There was a way that God caused them to overcome and to live. Rise up on your feet. Let's pray.